the Executive Director of Severe Institute, Dr. Tendai Murisa, is going to give a presentation on uh, the second report on citizens' perceptions. Citizens' perceptions and expectations. There was one report that was done uh, last year, which was the first report uh, after the current government came into power. And you can catch that on the Severe Institute website, which is severeinstitute.org. And um, you can read through that uh, report later, as well as this second report, which is also available on the website. Dr. Tendai Murisa? Okay, thank you very much. Shall we give him a round of applause? Good morning. Good morning, and uh, yeah, it's always uh, one of the most difficult assignments that we always joke about in uh, in our space is to try to speak after Godfrey. It's one of the most difficult things one can try to do. Uh, Godfrey has been both uh, a teacher and a mentor to many of us in this space, and his grasp of economics is uh, is amazing, is astounding, and he always makes it look so simple. And those who are messing up look so foolish by just failing to do the, the most simple things that are needed to be done. Uh, my task, I am, uh, I, I am privileged to work with a very brilliant team of uh, mostly millennials. And uh, when we started Severe Institute, one thing that we were very clear about was the need to us to sort of work on the edges. We knew we would never be the cutting edge policy research organization in terms of the kind of knowledge we generate. You know how talented Zimbabwe is. So we had to look for a niche, a space that we felt like others had not yet occupied. And for us, our interest has always been around how do we leverage technology to communicate policy, to communicate public issues. So what I'm going to be presenting is based on that kind of thinking. But also there is a reason to it, besides just trying to say, how do we position ourselves differently? One of the most important reasons is to say, how do millennials and the groups that come after them consume in information? The reports that Dr. Kanyenze made reference to, I can vouch that the millennials in this room and the millennials I interact with, they've never read them. And even if they were to see them, they'll never read them. You know, the World Bank reports, they are this thick. They are 300 pages, 400 pages. For some reason, we are not consuming information the way some of us were taught by Professor Masunungure and others to go through a report before we enter into the lecture room. But now people want 280 characters. They want a graph. It's a very pictorial sort of set of uh, people. But why is it important to deal with millennials uh, and the groups that come after them? In 2000, and the person who's going to vote for the first time in 2013 and uh, 2023 is 15 years today. Yeah, it's 15 years today, and where are they in terms of uh, consuming information to know about their country? What do they use? They don't buy the newspaper at the corner. Don't, they don't. They don't buy newspapers. So they are on Instagram. They are on Facebook. They are on Snapchat. Others are actually saying Facebook is behind. So when we begin to look at that, we begin to say to ourselves, then how do we communicate important developments in our country? We've come up with, uh, so as we discussed this, this assignment that I was given, where's Dominic? This assignment I was given to sort of present our report on the, the state uh, citizens' perceptions on the state of the economy. No, there's, okay, there it is. Mm -hmm. So we will start off by saying there is a context to this. In 2018, when the Constitutional Court threw out the challenge by the MDC to say the case was baseless, that was contested, contesting the election results of, uh, 2000, of July 2018, and uh, President Emerson Mnangagwa was then inaugurated as the president, uh, we, we had been tracking uh, the manifestos that had been written by different political parties. We had actually analyzed them on a platform that we call ZIMAT, the Zimbabwe Manifesto Analysis Tool, where we had compared the five major political parties, broken down their promises. We had actually broken down the promises of the ZANU-PF Manifesto into 240 promises. That's, uh, if you go to our signature platform, which is called www 
www.zimcitizenswatch.org, you'll see this. This is the cover page where we're saying when we're talking about democracy, we're talking about accountability and effectiveness. So we're tracking, and when we broke down the promises, we broke them down to there are 240 promises that are in that manifesto. I think the MDC promises were more, right, uh, from my team. I think they were around 318 thereabouts. And uh, Togozani Cooper's outfit is the one that had fewer promises, but they looked more balanced. So we did that analysis and we said in terms of economic ideology, there is no difference. They were all heading to, to this austerity neoliberal framework. But when the inauguration happened, we started tracking progress. And when we started tracking progress, as of yesterday, 548 days. Emerson Mnangagwa has been president since the elections for 548 days, uh, 15 hours, 55 minutes. Well, this was when they were doing this yesterday. Um, so the promises that they made are 240. Of those 240 promises, what they've completed or implemented are just four. Uh, but what is in progress is 144. I think given the fact that it's just close to the two-year mark, we should be interested in what is in progress, not what has been completed. They have a five-year term. Uh, this is where the media always misquotes us because they rush to the fore. They don't look at the in progress. Then 88 have not been commenced. Four have already been broken. Yeah? Uh, okay. So some of these promises. No, let me go. Dominic, can you take me to the site? Okay, so that is the live site on the website as you go to it. Uh, can you go down? Aha, that's what, no, no, again. So we took these 240 promises and we clustered them. Up again, yeah? Okay, so we took them and we clustered them around these areas. Uh, the manifesto may not have them organized this way, but this is us now trying to make sense out of the manifestos. So there's promises to do with the economy, promises to do with agriculture and rural development, social service delivery, trade and international relations, local governance, youth and gender, governance, politics and civil rights, and corruption. But given the fact that today we're doing a, di a dialogue on the state of the economy, let's just look at the economy. So they made 117 promises to do with economic recovery. 117 promises. Of those 117 promises, only three have been implemented and 70 are in progress. They have not commenced on 42, and they have broken two. Can we just uh, look at the broken ones? Then I will urge colleagues in your spare time to go to the site and look at this. So the first one is to promote the use of other currencies in the multi-currency basket in order to reduce over-reliance on the USD. But we know that this already, there's been a turnaround in the policy. If you remember, everyone kept on talking about, telling us that the multi-currency regime is not going anywhere. But now we know where we are. So this is a broken promise. It was an electoral promise that stability is going to be hinged upon use of a multi-currency regime. Can we look for the next broken promise? Uh, attain economic growth of at least 6% per annum over the period 2018-2023. For all those who know the 2018 figures, 2019 figures, they were not 6%. Actually, yesterday, yesterday wasn't it negative growth? It was minus 6. So again, a broken pro promise. They failed to, meet, to live up to the promise they had made to say they were going to grow the economy by at least 6%. Okay. Uh, I think I'm done just demonstrating that. Can you take me back to my presentation? So for those who want to know more about those, uh, how we were tracking it, etc., those are the different filters that you'll have to use. Are we in my PowerPoint? Okay. So, so the, we are trying, given that we're talking about the economy, we said let's look for the, 12, the top 10 promises across the sector. The first one was promoting productivity, enhancing support systems and infrastructure in the next five years. Then uh, for those who are interested, like some friends of mine who are in this room, around corruption, uh, swift justice will be served on, served on perpetrators of crime and other acts of economic sabotage. What the track actually tries to do, we try to get the wording as it is in the manifesto so, do, so that we don't seem like we're trying to rewrite their manifestos. Uh, and the promise was anyone found guilty of corruption will be immediately fired and punished accordingly. Nobody is above the law. 
So, so this is a modification. If you remember towards when uh, the president had been elected, he came up with a pledge card. So this one's modi modi modified according to the pledge card. But the challenge right now, you know that there's no one who's, been, who's, in, who's in prison for corruption, right? There's no one. Uh, many others are talking of a catch and release, yada, yada. But they also there are frustrations. The president was at a meeting organized by Transparency International saying that there's nothing as difficult as prosecuting these cases. He actually said, I, for this case, I wish actually I was not the president, but I was the lawyer doing the prosecution. Because just showing that he's also sort of, well, if we're to believe what you are saying, that is also sort of uh, frustrated by the slow progress around the, resol the resolution of cases to do with corruption. Then achieving fiscal and debt sustainability, this also has not been done. We are actually in a, we're actually in a worse off position now, given what uh, Dr. Kanyenze just took us through.